Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome back to episode number 159 of the Healthy Skin Show. Today's episode was inspired by a series of questions that I've gotten from listeners over the last year asking for more information on a very specific condition. This condition is called Grover's disease. And recently I was in my Facebook group and a lot of people with this condition were really surprised that I would even bother doing an episode on a condition that doesn't impact nearly as many people as those with eczema and psoriasis, but it is a condition that does plague certain individuals, and there's not a whole lot of information out there from a little bit more of an integrative or alternative approach to helping people manage and address this particular condition. So today's guest is going to dive into this, and it's a really interesting episode, so I hope that you will enjoy and share this with other people whom you know who've been diagnosed with Grover's disease. Before we dive into today's conversation, I wanted to take a listener's question. JD wrote in and asked, why do I have persistent dermatitis on my forehead and nose, which is gradually moving downward? Is this related to a bacteria? JD, I want to take a moment to thank you so much for emailing in your question. I love when people, especially listeners, take initiative and are willing to submit some great questions to the show. The first thing that I tell any client that sets up an appointment and isn't 100% sure what exactly is going on is to go to a dermatologist and find out what exactly they believe the diagnosis is. I oftentimes find that encouraging clients to kind of get some sort of diagnosis if they're really not sure what's going on can be helpful. And it can kind of help point us in a certain direction. You can ask the doctor to do a biopsy. They may agree to do that. They might not. You can also ask your doctor to do a culture. And a culture basically is taking a swab of the skin, the area where the rash is, and then applying that to a Petri dish and allowing whatever is there to grow to see if it's a particular bacteria or fungal organism. It can be different things. So asking the question, is it related to a bacteria? Sure, it could be. It could also be related to a fungal overgrowth. It could be related to demodex mites. We have this entire complex ecosystem that lives upon our skin. And so it's important to not assume that it's just one thing if there is a dysbiosis, so an imbalance of that skin microbiome, we then have to say, well, how did this happen? Why would this have happened? And that's where we start to look not just at outside pieces to this puzzle, but also internal. So a couple of exterior triggers that a lot of times people look at first are number one, what are you washing your towels and sheets with, right? Because your face is going to be touching those particular items. And then what are you washing your face with? Is it possible that the face wash or soap or whatever it is that you're using is too abrasive or too harsh for that acidic pH balance that we really require for the skin. Remember, we want that to be at a 4.5 and things like water, things like soap, alkalize the skin, right? It disrupts the pH, which can ultimately disrupt the bugs that live on the surface of the skin. A couple of other points here, water treatment can add certain things like fluoride, chlorine, or chloramine to your water. There can be other chemicals that are added, so you can look at your local water report to see what's actually in your water. However, if you have like a well and you are drinking well water, I've also had people write in and say after investigation, they found out that their well water was contaminated with some sort of bacterial overgrowth. So those are two options to absolutely consider. And sometimes people will have hard water, will have a whole lot of minerals, a lot of iron, etc. And maybe that is irritating to your skin. So those are some exterior options to consider. As far as the internal piece to this, if those do not resolve it, then perhaps it's time to look deeper. And that's where we want to say, okay, well, 
if the gut microbiome, right, the bugs that live in our GI tract are sort of like command central, if we think of it like that, and they help communicate to the different microbiomes in the body. And so dysbiosis internally can trigger a dysbiotic state externally or in these other gut bug camps throughout the body. What could be going on internally? And so we know from clinical research that people who have various chronic skin conditions, like even eczema and psoriasis, just those two alone, we know that the proportion of health supportive gut bugs tends to be skewed in a direction that may not actually perpetuate one's best health. And in the case of eczema, for example, it is not uncommon to see an excess of staph aureus grow in the gut where you normally wouldn't necessarily see that. And so this is where we want to start looking deeper and saying, okay, where does my skin rash picture fit into the 16 root causes framework that, for example, I talk about a lot. And so one really cool resource that might be helpful for you to start to figure this out is looking at my skin rash root cause finder. And what that will do, it'll walk you through all of these 16 root causes, and it's literally just you check things off, right? And then it can help you focus on what are the potential red flags here. That way you're not looking at everything and trying to say, okay, I have all of these issues because, you know, Jen talks about all of them. I must have all of them. And that's absolutely not the case. It'll help you focus your energy a lot more and give you a better sense of where to begin from more of that internal perspective. So I'll link to that e-guide in the show notes. That way you guys can go and download it. It's completely free. And I know that whatever type of rash that you're dealing with, this can be incredibly helpful as a starting point, because that's oftentimes the hardest point is like, where do I begin? How do I figure out what the root causes are and what's driving this? And this little workbook is a really great place to start. All right. With that said, I want to dive into today's conversation. That way I can be respectful of your time because I know that your time is valuable. My guest today is a returning guest. You guys probably remember him at this point. His name is Dr. Raja Sivamani. He's a board certified dermatologist and practices at Pacific Skin Institute. He's an adjunct associate professor of clinical dermatology at the University of California, Davis, and director of clinical research and the clinical trials unit. He's also an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the California State University, Sacramento. He engages in clinical practice as well is both clinical and translational research that integrates bioengineering, nutrition, plant science, cosmetics, and skin biology. With training in both allopathic and Ayurvedic medicine, Dr. Sivamani takes a holistic approach to his patients and in his research, and that's why we love him here on The Healthy Skin Show. Thanks so much, Dr. Sivamani, for joining us again on The Healthy Skin Show. You know, Jennifer, I always have a lot of fun when I come on the show with you. So I'm looking forward to another great episode. Yeah, today I wanted to talk to you about Grover's disease. And I'm going to be honest with you and the listeners. I was not familiar with what this was. However, I've gotten a number of emails from listeners asking me to do an episode or some research on what it is and are there any alternative ideas around how to address it from maybe a little bit more of an integrative standpoint. And the first person I thought of was you because you're so knowledgeable and you explain things so well. So for those who are not familiar with what this is, or maybe somebody who has just been diagnosed with this. What exactly is Grover's disease? Yeah, Grover's disease is a condition that can be very chronic. And uh, I'll describe the physical findings first. Typically, what you get is you get all of these scaly, what we call papules, essentially bumps, that scatter in the areas where you tend to have a bit more sweating on your trunk. Tends to be uh, the chest, the stomach area, uh, the back, maybe onto the shoulders. And it doesn't really go beyond that much. Some people can get it to extend onto their upper legs. Uh, some people can get it onto their arms, but really tends to, sense, tends to be on the trunk. 
Um, one of the things about it, and we don't understand why this is, it tends to happen in middle-aged folks, uh, pre predominantly men, but I have plenty of women that have it as well. The official name for it is transient acantholytic dermatosis. And what that means is, um, and that's a very descriptive uh, diagnosis. And one of the funny things about dermatology, I never knew this, Jennifer, that I was going to learn this moment much Latin. Of course, any Latin scholar would probably <laughs> scoff at me and be like, you don't know Latin. But I feel like I've learned a tiny bit of Latin in here and uh, just talking about all these medical terminologies. It basically is saying that transient means it comes and goes. Uh, what's happening is that you have a breakdown of the connections between the what we call the epidermal cells, which is the top layer of the skin, the most superficial layer. There's a breakdown of those connections and what happens is you just don't have the normal skin barrier in that area and you get the scaling and it can be quite itchy. So basically what it amounts to is scaling bumps, which are which can be very itchy and annoying. And when I say annoying, I mean to the point where it can affect sleep, it can affect your sense of sanity for some people. So it can be end up being quite a big deal. So I don't want to say, you know, when I say these small bumps, they can they can really affect uh, other aspects of your life. And they're just chronic and remitting. Now, and we can go over what causes them to worsen, what are treatments, but that in a nutshell is what Grover's disease is. Um, it's chronic, it's not necessarily life-threatening, but it can be lifestyle threatening. Mm. And, and and that would be really interesting to talk a little bit about what does make it worse. I think that's a really good point of depression because this like you say, itching and even sometimes things that people feel are unsightly and make people stare or ask questions or they just feel incredibly self-conscious as you you acknowledge. And I think that's an important point for especially as a dermatologist, because a lot of times people feel like they aren't being heard or their issues are being minimized. And one thing I deeply appreciate about you is your empathy that you have for your patients. And so recognizing that there are so many different factors that can go into how you feel about yourself and your self-confidence and self-worth because of what's happening to your skin in relation to other people, and then how that can be made or how it can worsen. So what exactly would be some, are there triggers or are there certain conditions that would make this worse than others? Uh, yeah, there are. Well, first of all, I'll say if you think you have Grover's disease from what I'm describing, just please make sure that you see a dermatologist to get this evaluated. This is one of those conditions that's slightly esoteric in the sense that um, we in dermatology see this often enough, but it's just one of those things where, you know, if you're not a dermatologist, maybe you've learned about it, maybe you haven't. Um, and so then you just want to be sure you get a, the right diagnosis because there are some other conditions to make sure that you don't have. There are other conditions like something known as Darrier's disease, which is more genetic and something that might come from childhood typically in those folks. But you can get some autoimmune conditions too that can mimic this. Um, uh, there's things called pemphigus foliaceus. Uh, there's other factors like seborrheic dermatitis that can be very um, inflammatory. You could get a folliculitis. It could just be a folliculitis where your hair follicles are inflamed. Uh, and so there's a whole list of treatment possibilities after you've gotten the diagnosis correct. So I just say that as a first step. Just make sure that you get this confirmed. What we know is that People that end up sweating, for whatever reason, when there's extra moisture, it causes uh, Grover's to break out. And whether that means it's from sweating from activity or sweating from the weather or just, you know, if you're wearing really warm clothes, whatever it is, if you don't have your skin breathing or allowing it to breathe, uh, we know there's a greater tendency for this uh, for this condition to flare. And so obviously, I would think people who live in more humid, hot climates could be affected by this, and it may even impact your ability to exercise. Yeah, I think that one of the one of the issues is when you exactly when you have humidity or anything that's increasing the sweat uh, on your skin, and and the key I think is when the sweat sits there. Now, if it's able to evaporate pretty quickly, um, I I don't think it's going to be as much of an issue. There's never an end all be all in any of these conditions because you know all of us are going to have different tendencies and different levels of severity of the of the Grovers if you do get it. But 
you're right. If you are going to be exercising and you're, the sweat's just staying pooled, make sure you wear breathable clothing. That's like a, a, a simple thing. And a lot of people forget that breathable clothing, cotton, things that wick moisture away are important, especially if you get the fabrics that are more wicking. That, that, that could be very important rather than ones that will keep that moisture just stuck right on your skin. And the second part of it is, yes, the environment you can't necessarily change, but you just have to be mindful and you might have to put things on your skin that are going to help keep it drier, uh, keep yourself a little bit cooler if possible. Um, and then also, you know, if you do have a breakout, there are treatments that we can talk about as well. Yeah. And really quick, because we're talking about sweating, and I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. This is what popped into my head right now. What about like a lot of people are doing saunas and there's a whole movement of like sweating being very positive and people are using red light therapy and 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 all of these infrared saunas and whatnot. So for someone with Grover's disease, would that be potentially contraindicated? I think everything, we always have the term of uh, relative contraindication versus absolute. Absolute means it's an absolute no-no. Relative just means be careful, watch how your skin's going to react. Yeah, if you come from the Ayurvedic perspective, just taking a step aside, when you look at Grover's, it's someone that's going to have a tendency towards sweating, and it's going to be someone that has a tendency towards inflammation. So when you look at the when you look at the elements that are involved, and usually in Ayurveda you have five elements that are involved, and we won't go into much detail, but I think it's really important just to look at lifestyle tendencies. You have Earth, water, air, fire, ether. Those are the five elements. And, you know, we could do another podcast maybe on what all these mean. <laughs> but without jumping into that too much, if you look at Grover's, you have too much sweating, which is uh, a resemblance of the water element. And then you have too much inflammation, which is a resemblance of the fire element. So when you look at w both of those, you know, when you go into something like a sauna, you are adding more moisture to the skin. So if you are dehydrated or if your skin is extremely dry, then you might have an opportunity where you're going to hydrate your skin. But people with Grover's, they're having too much uh, moisture sitting on their skin. So saunas would ha definitely have a higher risk of uh, inflaming Grover's. So you do have to watch for that. Okay, that's a, that's a really good point to make. Again, because a lot of people see all this stuff online and they want to give it a try because it's working for so – it appears to work for so many people. But we always have to remember – Every single one of us is unique. We are different from everyone else. And so our circumstance may make someone's, what is it that, that uh, someone else's, um, something like it's someone you're it what it works for someone else can be like almost like poison to you yeah, it one may not be treasure is another person's yes. poison right yes exactly <laughs> exactly so uh, what are some things that you found to be helpful as far as treatment options obviously i think the the lifestyle issues around trying to keep the body cooler wicking sweat away is really important but if someone has no idea how to deal with this and they're just literally it's almost like playing whack-a-mole, just trying to deal with things and flares as they arise. What are some things that they could do? And I, I assume a dermatologist would be helpful in identifying these uh, steps for them. Yeah, the key is to uh, to think about what are the the different reasons that Grover's develops and then go after each of those reasons. And really the main reasons and issues at hand with Grover's is that uh, firstly, there's too much heat. So, and that could be local heat or just overall, like if someone has a fever or they get sick, sometimes the Grover's can break out in that situation too, because you're going to be sweating more. So there's too much heat. Um, and, and the heat could be local too, if you're trapping the heat, you know, for whatever reason. Secondly, there's too much moisture. And then thirdly, there's too much inflammation. And really when you break it down, those are the three subset of um, reasons why Grover's flares. And so you, you can try to identify each of those things. So if we start with, and we'll come back to heat at the end. If you look at, I have too much inflammation, let's start there because that's really where the symptoms come in. If you have too much inflammation, there are a variety of things that people do. Uh, steroids, topical steroids are used temporarily to get inflammation down and steroids are very effective. If you're coming, if you're seeing a dermatologist, that is probably one of the first things that they're going to do. But when it comes to a steroid, think about, how that steroid is being delivered. Is it coming in an ointment? Is it coming in a cream? Is it coming in a lotion? 
And we have to balance a couple of things here. When you have Grover's, your skin is broken down in those areas. So when you put uh, any sort of a, a topical formulation on your skin, if there's more of an alcohol base, it may sting your skin for some people. But for others, if you put on something that's too heavy, like a uh, ointment, that may actually trap more moisture. So it's one of these Goldilocks principles where you just have to find the right formulation. It's not a one size fits all. So you have to figure out, okay, if I'm gonna get a steroid, is it gonna be an ointment, which is thick, a cream, which is kind of in between, sometimes can sting, or can it be just a solution that's easy to put on, very watery and liquidy, but sometimes that can sting more. And for some people, it turns out to feel really good. But that's the first thing. So you have steroids. The second thing is sometimes when it gets really bad, um, you you might be given antibiotics for several reasons. One, there could be a secondary infection because the skin is broken down in this area. You could get a secondary infection. So you have to watch out for that. Probably the more common reason why you might get an antibiotic is that antibiotics, rather than treating an infection, they're reducing inflammation. And again, uh, one of the tenets of treating Grover's is to reduce inflammation. So uh, the antibiotics can get in and get in through the system, so they may be topical or, or oral antibiotics, but typically ends up being a course of oral antibiotics. That is sometimes used to reduce the inflammation, and some dermatologists and some practitioners may use an oral antifungal. They just give you a tiny burst. So I just bring that up as another possibility that they may talk to you. And finally, one of the things that happens it, that you're trying to treat with inflammation is you're trying to reduce the cells from what we call turning over or having that those connections because when those connections break down you want to turn those cells over and then reduce how active those cells are being so it kind of settles into a state where they don't break down as easily and so you might use what's known as a retinoid so you could use either oral acetretin or some people use isotretinoin, which is uh, uh, the generic for Accutane. A lot of us don't like to do that uh, in that case, but acetretin is one that many of us will use orally. And then you might use a topical retinoid. You have to be careful with the topical retinoid, though. That can be very aggravating. Okay, so that's the inflammation part of things. There are uh, numerous things in the medical literature, by the way, Jennifer. Like, uh, well, you know, what happens in these sorts of conditions is if there isn't one known treatment, we try like tens and tens of them and none of them work perfectly but kind of just giving you a flavor second thing when you're looking at the um the the moisture issue uh, you you want to bring that down so the way to bring the moisture down is a, a couple ways there are some oral medications that can reduce sweating we try not to go there if we don't have to but that is an option it would be um off label so i just want to put a disclaimer here that some of the things that i'm mentioning are off label you really do need to speak to your doctor about these things but just generically uh, there are ways that we try to approach reducing sweating the other thing is putting on something astringent can you have some sort of an astringent herb that you put on and a common common one is witch hazel you can use something that's just going to be astringent so that uh, it can absorb uh, the moisture. and Or it could be something like an absorptive powder that you put on your body to try to improve as well. So those are, those are some factors. And then, you know, uh, the heat part of it, what kind of clothes are you wearing? Uh, it, can you wear more breathable clothes? Uh, are, you, uh, are you wearing things that get sweaty and then stick to your skin or they wick moisture away? These are all factors that you think about. And finally, the itching. Sometimes um, what we can do is we can give anti-itch lotions. Some of them have uh, chemicals like menthol and camphor that can really reduce the itching. Or uh, sometimes if it's really out of control and you're just trying to get it under control, they can give you anti-itch medications that you could take orally as well. Wow. So this is, is this generally like a lifelong issue that you found in your, in your um, practice? It's a funny thing. Um, a, a, it's it's something that doesn't show up until, and for many people, until their 40s and 50s, and it does last for a few years. And for some people, I don't know why, it just gets better. And and for some people, it's as simple as uh, they were a little bit overweight and they were sweating more easily, and then they lost that weight and their body was in a different state, and then it went away. And for other people, they lose all the weight they can get into shape, and they still deal with it. So. We don't have the total handle on why it uh, you know, comes on and how quickly it's going to go away. But for some people, it does get better. It, it, it goes into a remittive state. And one last question. Have you found in working with pa these patients any specific like diet tricks that you've given to them that 
I think diet from the perspective of maybe, I mean, obviously let, let's clean up our diet, right? So if you're eating a yeah. really junk food diet, the first thing yeah. it's, and it's an easy thing is, Hey, let's start integrating in more colorful whole foods and whatnot. But do you have any tips for someone who may be dealing with a lot of inflammation, right? That's driving this. Are there any foods that might be helpful that you've found um, from working with these patients? Yeah, I try to stay away from, by the way, I think that's a great question. I try to stay away from foods that are going to spike the insulin and IGF pathway because some of those can also trigger your oil glands to secrete more sebum and that's going to trap more moisture than you might need and uh, because it tends to be on the chest and back and stomach area and especially the chest and back, uh, your oil glands are pretty active, the sebaceous glands. So I get people to stay away from high glycemic foods as much as possible. It's probably better for their overall health and better for weight control too. Dairy, I get people off dairy. Um, are these proven associations? No, they're not. But I'm I'm trying to think of the mechanisms that are involved at this exactly. point. Exactly. And, and dairy, dairy, from my understanding, dairy can actually... Is it that it increases um, some of these, like the growth factors, or it, that it stimulates them in the body? Is that the connection there? It 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 is actually you know it's have become even more complex. Uh, it it does both of what you're saying. It can stimulate uh, flares and increases in uh, insulin and in IGF one, um, but it also may directly once it absorbs some of the dairy proteins may also directly get to the skin surface and then activate the skin in other ways. And we've done some early studies looking at cell culture. And uh, so I think dairy has multiple ways that it has its actions. Of course, you know, this is why babies need dairy when they're growing up because it helps them grow. But at some point, you don't need that insulin spike over and over again. And it can show up in a variety of ways, such as weight gain. And sometimes you can have extra oil on the skin. So... Yes, I do. Uh, I do get people off dairy, and also going to low fat. I just want to make this point: going to low fat actually may be worse because low fat dairy tends to have even more um, filler content in there, which can be oligosaccharides and whey. And then going to milk alternatives, if they're still dairy, it's still dairy. So going to like A2 milk or lac- lactose-free milk doesn't change that. It's still got the dairy proteins in there. You really do have to just go off of uh, dairy altogether. And uh, so, and I have had questions. Oh, what about dairy like uh, almond milk? And I just want to remind everyone that almond almonds uh, almond milk. I know the word milk is in there, but that is dairy free. If you yes. go to something like almond milk or cashew or macadamia, they have so many great nuts now. Pistachio. They do. And oat. That's another great mm-hmm. milk. So a lot of alternatives. Uh, that Absolutely. Are and what about ghee? Do you have any thoughts on is would you still consider ghee a problem if the proteins have been removed or would that maybe be the one possible okay dairy? It's a good question. You know, I, in, in Ayurvedic medicine, we always talk about ghee as being um, much less uh, of an issue compared to butter. And I think that is true. Uh you know, having a little ghee in your food uh, is okay, but you know, for a lot of folks, uh, if if you're dealing with too much moisture and whatnot, you don't really need the ghee either. I think using That's it true. is probably safer, but uh, I, you know, if people are willing to come off the ghee, uh, I'm fine with that too. Uh, it's uh, that one. I'm I'm really you know either or. It's on the fence. <laughs> it's on the fence because I, I think it is I think it is uh, better for your health. I, I, I don't see it as being as much of an issue. And many times when people put ghee in, you know, they're not taking tremendous amounts. They're putting in a True. tiny bit to oleate their food. So it's a exactly. little different. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I just want to thank you so much for enlightening all of us about this issue. And I'm excited now for people who are asking about Grover's disease so that they now have a different perspective. And I love that you brought in the Ayurvedic perspective as well. And it sounds like this is, it's not just a skin issue. This is a a life issue. You know, you have to look at your diet. You've got to look at the products you use. You need to look at all of these different factors and um, make some shifts to be in better balance with your own body. So um, first of all, I want to thank you for being here yet again. And I want to encourage everyone to go check out your website 
website, especially those who are listening who are health practitioners, doctors, um, other nutritionists, dietitians, acupuncturists, etc. Anyone in the field of really helping people and you're really interested in this whole integrative approach to dermatology, LearnSkin.com is an excellent resource for practitioners to really connect with other like-minded practitioners around skin issues, but also to become incredibly educated on these issues from this more I think it's a very forward thinking position. And you've also got a great podcast as well, which I've been on and we'll have to share the links to to that show. So I just want to encourage everyone to really connect with you because I think the the work that you're putting out there and everything that you are doing is we're starting to see this elevation and awareness that there are so many more things to your skin than just your skin. And I love that. Oh, that's absolutely true, Jennifer. And thanks for doing what you do as well. And this is fun. It's uh, the times are changing. We're getting to really thinking about ourselves holistically. And so it's, it's the better way to go. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Of course. I deeply appreciate Dr. Sivamani coming back on the show and sharing his incredible insight with all of us, especially as we all together as a community walk down this road of saying, what are the other options? And he's just so insightful and so positive. You know, I wish sometimes we had a whole lot of Dr. Sivamani's. We could clone him, but fortunately, he is so willing to share his knowledge and create an integrative dermatology community that I want to make sure that you guys are aware that there is an annual symposium. It's called the Integrative Dermatology Symposium. This really is for practitioners. It's not for um, you guys if you're struggling because this is more at a medical level. But this is great if you're coming to this from that nutrition perspective or maybe you're a physician yourself or some other type of practitioner and you tend to work with or you have this really deep interest and passion around helping people with these chronic skin issues, consider attending the Integrative Dermatology Symposium. Normally it would be held in person, but this year it has gone completely virtual as most conferences have. And it is happening from October 23rd through November 1st. Anyone can join and everything is online. And by the way, it doesn't matter what country you live in, everything will be accessible. And that way we can help spread this information farther across the globe and help more people. I will be in attendance. I had planned to go last year, but couldn't make it. I'm super excited to be there this year. And many of the guests from the Healthy Skin Show are actually going to be there as well as their attendees or they're going to be presenting. So if you just love this show and you learn so much and it's really helping you in your clinical practice, I would highly encourage you to head on over to integrativedermatologysymposium.com, sign up, and I will see you there. As always, all of the resources that we talk about, all of the links, everything can be found over at skinterrupt.com forward slash 159. There you can also leave any questions or comments on this episode so that we can keep the conversation going. You guys know the whole deal with the Healthy Skin Show. It is incredibly important that you share this episode. If you know someone that is struggling with Grover's disease, or you're in a Facebook group where you could share this with people that it might finally reach somebody who really feels completely lost and hopeless, struggling with Grover's disease, make sure to share this episode with them because remember, sharing is caring. And if you haven't done so yet, head on over to your podcast platform of choice, rate and review the Healthy Skin Show to let people know why you find this show so valuable, so helpful. That way for someone new who's looking around for a show, seeking information, they can know what the value is that they can get from tuning in. Thank you so much for joining me and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.